Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us on this Facebook uh, live stream. So for today's live stream, it's uh, episode three of the Hidden Histories of San Jose, Japantown, and we're at uh, episode number three right now. And um, today's uh, event will be uh, on the Filipino Americans of San Jose, Japantown. Uh, my name is Chris Kiyoki. I'm the Public Programs Director for the uh, museum. Uh, hope everyone is doing well, staying healthy during these COVID-19 times. Uh, currently, the uh, museum is closed, and so uh, we wanted to continue to do uh, programming that we normally had at the museum, uh, but now we're using the uh, virtual live streams. Uh, hopefully, we'll be able to, you know, go back to having uh, events at the museum. Uh, until then, uh, we'll be doing our, our, our streams. So uh, throughout today's program, uh, if you have any questions or comments, um, if you could please add them into the Facebook chat. Uh, Sydney, one of our volunteers, is uh, monitoring the uh, Facebook chat, and she'll be able to get any questions or comments that, that you have uh, over to the, uh, to the speakers. And uh, we'll try to address as many of the questions and comments as we can during our Q&A portion of the statement. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so before we get started, I'd like to talk to you a little bit about the JAMS mission statement. And um, the museum's mission uh, is to collect, preserve, and share uh, the Japanese American history, cultures, and arts. So, um, you know, with the mission statement, uh, we're able to have programs um, with such uh, for the uh, the hidden histories of San Jose Japantown project, that was one of the the um, projects that came when we did follow our our mission. Uh, next slide, please. Um, for uh, today's agenda, is um, uh, Kurt Fukuda will be given an overview of the hidden histories uh, hidden histories of San Jose Japantown project. Uh, Tony Santa Anna will talk about the. Filipino American community today. And uh, Robert Ragsack will talk about the history of Pinoy Town. Uh, this will be followed by a, uh, a Q and A. And again, so if you if you guys have any questions, comments, um, if you could just type them into the uh, the chat section in the Facebook. So anyway, enough of me. Let's get down to the good stuff here. Um, I'd like to introduce uh, Kurt Fukuda, and Kurt is the archivist of the uh, San Jose, or, I'm sorry, the Hidden Histories uh, Project uh, for San Jose, Japantown. And so, Kurt, if you'd like to take it away here. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Chris. Um, for those of you who missed our first uh, two episodes, I'll recap the Hidden Histories of San Jose, Japantown. It's a creative art project of the San Jose, um, the Japanese American Museum of San Jose with the support of the California History Center. The project is funded by the Immersive Technology and the Arts Grant from the John S. and James L. Knight Foundation uh, in collaboration with uh, Microsoft. Now the project will produce nine augmented reality works that will be presented outside the museum in San Jose, Japantown, and you'll be able to access these pieces of art on your mobile device uh, next year, and hopefully um, by then the shelter in place will be lifted. Um, the augmented reality technology is similar to the one that was used in Pokemon, the game Pokemon Go, where you would go to a location and you would see something created by uh, computer technology that uh, is re exists in the environment. Um, <clears throat> uh, just to recap, uh, our, our uh, project has uh, six community advisory panel members, and these members will be choosing the nine final art pieces that will be uh, displayed in Japantown. The uh, community panel members are Steve Fujita, who was with JAM and a scholar, Robert Ragsack, a historian and lecturer, Tony Santa Ana, a scholar and activist, 
Gordon Smith, who's uh, on the board of JAMS, Brenda He Wong of the Chinese Historical and Cultural Project, and Connie Young Yu, the uh, historian and writer. Um, in just to bring you up to date as to what is happening with the Hidden Histories of San Jose Japantown project, um, on August the 22nd, the artists who are participating in the project will have a group discussion with Tamiko Thiel, who is a premier augmented reality artist, and she is actually the inspiration of the whole project. They are gonna be meeting with her to figure out how to translate their concepts and how to prior, prioritize uh, realizing them in the augmented reality uh, uh, technology. Then on September the 7th, the artists will submit their final proposals to the advisory panel who will then choose the nine final uh, finalists. Now, um, the Hidden Histories of San Jose Japan Town produces, we produce videos which will keep you up to date on the project. Also, these videos include historical stories and anecdotes of San Jose Japan Town, which uh, gives a great insight into the history of the Asian culture. Um, we, we encourage everyone to please go to youtube.com search for Hidden Histories of San Jose Japantown and subscribe to our YouTube channel so you don't miss a single video. That's, uh, we try to uh, come out with one every week. Uh, our project also has a Facebook page and we're also on Instagram as well. As um, Chris said, today's um, episode is about the Filipinos of San Jose Japantown. We have two guests, Tony Santa Ana and Robert Ragsack. Our first guest is going to be Tony Santa Ana, who is a scholar and activist. And I'm looking for Tony out there. Are you there, Tony? I am. Thank All you very right. much. All I'm right. here. I'm here. Good. I'm glad to be here. Great to see you. Hey. Um, the floor is yours, Tony. Take it away. Great, great. So uh, first off, I would like to uh, just to thank Jams um, and everybody on this call who invited me, who's behind the scenes, uh, Kurt for inviting me, Chris and, and Michael and Sydney for, for doing all the tech work. Um, so I'm, I'm very thankful for the invitation, as well as um, I'm very thankful that I'm on the Hidden Histories Community Advisory uh, panel uh, for this monumentous project with AR and uh, just documenting and just creating just great art for J-Town. So thank you very much. So um, as Kurt was saying, my name is uh, Tony Santa Ana, but my full name is Anthony Abulencia Santa Ana. And I want to say that because uh, I want to honor my, my grandfather who I was named after. Um, and then my, of course, my mother's maiden name is uh, Abulencia and then my father's is Santa Ana. So my parents are both from the Philippines. My father, he's actually from uh, Bicol, uh, and my mother is from Kalashao, Pangasinan. And so they actually immigrated from the Philippines to Canada first, and then they came over uh, to the United States, um, and specifically to the San Francisco Bay Area. They came over like in the late 60s. It was called the brain drain generation. It was one of the largest probably the largest wave of immigration of Filipinos to the United States. Um, we call that the brain drain generation. And so my, my father was a machinist on the railroads working at Amtrak. And then my mother was a teacher um, working in the school districts as well as in the superior court. Um, and so I say that because I want to give context of uh, and honoring my parents because I, I wasn't born in the Philippines. I was actually born in America. I was born in San Francisco, uh, but raised in San Jose. So that's where my story, my story begins. But I have to pay homage to, to my parents for actually really having a radical imagination and, and that dream of an immigrant of coming to the United States and having a better life and having a uh, you know, better future for their future children. Um, and so uh, I was raised in San Jose. 
Um, I'm actually from the east side of San Jose. I went to all the public schools here. Actually, I went to St. Patrick's High School in down uh, St. Patrick's uh, School in uh, downtown San Jose. Then went to uh, the elementary school, Los Arbolis, so the middle school, and then Andrew Hill High School. And so, when I was in Andrew Hill High School, there was a there was a program that was just starting. It was called the Filipino Youth Coalition, and I wasn't very familiar with Filipino Youth Coalition or Filipino culture. I knew what Filipino culture was because I was Filipino, but only knew what was in my house, but I didn't know the historical context. Um, and so at that time I was still in high school and uh, one of the founders, the, uh, the adult founders, his name was Steve Arevalo. Uh, he was one of my mentors. He was the one who taught me a lot about community. He, uh, he actually invited me to do my, one of my first workshops. And, um, and uh, I know Manang Robert, uh, in the, uh, after me, he'll be talking about Steve Arevalo and the connection to that. But, but I didn't know at the time that actually Steve Arevalo, his family actually lived in J-Town um, in the early days. And Manang Robert will definitely talk about that. Uh, so I just want to pay a homage to, to Steve Arevalo. I call him Uncle Steve. And so when I was in FYC, um, he actually used to take us to Japantown the, and specifically to this picture here. The Filipino Community Center. You can't see the center because a tree is is hiding it. Um, but this is a center where it's on Sixth Street, I believe, on Sixth and Jackson, and um, and there is a back part there where there was a lot of different festivals going on. So I would spend my summers there, going to um, dances and parties. I actually took a Filipino Tagalog lesson there. Um, and there was actually a huge mural there. And it, at the time, it was one of their very few Filipino American murals in the United States. Um, and unfortunately, they, they painted over it. Um, so it's no longer there. There are some pictures of it, but it's no longer there. Um, so I actually kind of grew up in the Filipino uh, community center area with J-Town because uh, Uncle Steve, uh, Uncle Steve Revelo used to take us there. Um, and we used to do tours there because there was uh, the uh, Masonic Lodge there uh, and so on. Next slide, please. And so this is actually down the street. And this is called the Northside Community Center, which is uh, another place that I also grew up in that has a historical significance for the Filipino community. It's named after uh, uh, um, uh, activist uh, Jacinto Tony Sakig. And uh, I used to go there uh, and help feed the feed the elderly uh, Filipinos uh, there and we used to um, have events there we used to have spoken word nights there we used to have uh, events there all the time for the community so this has a historical significance uh, Filipino dance troops used to to practice there um, and so now it's a it's 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 a beautiful building that is for seniors uh, and they they also they also feed the seniors there uh, but that's pretty much down the street from the Filipino Community Center. And so um, those two places are dear, very dear to my heart in terms of the community. Um, a lot of Filipinos may not live around that area uh, now, currently, uh, but definitely it was very much thriving um, back in the day when Manon Robert will talk about that. So next slide. So um, as I as as it evolved, J-Town was evolving, and uh, interesting enough, I want to say about ten years ago, uh, maybe around that time, that Japantown actually started becoming like a quote unquote cool place to go to. Uh, a lot of shops started popping up, um, a lot of events started popping up, um, and that area started become uh, an attraction for younger folks, urbanites. Uh, for, for folks who um, are in the tech industry, but very young, who wanted a place to hang out. Um, and this shop here is called Kukui. And this is one of, probably, it's owned by a Filipino, um, uh, Orly. And uh, it's a clothing brand. It's a brand that lots of Filipinos and uh, Pacific Islanders, they actually represent that. And um, they do a lot uh, of events. Uh, they have events at J-Town. They, they do festivals, um, but definitely they are a premier San Jose clothing brand uh, owned by a Filipino. Um, so I just wanted to say that that's right around the corner from the Filipino Community Center. Okay, next slide. And then this is um, another uh, shop that's down the street uh, from Kukui. It's called the Arsenal. 
And it's owned by two uh, two uh, partners. Uh, one, the names is Sean Boyles and Roanne. They're, they're husband and wife. Uh, they own this shop. And it's an art studio. And this art studio is, um, is a place where people go there from the community to learn uh, about painting. They have art supplies. Um, we've done Filipino-American uh, parole uh, workshops there. So it's a very art space, uh, but very much for the community. Um, owned by two Filipinos. Okay, next, next to slide. All right, so this I want to say is very, very contemporary. Um, and this is, uh, this is actually one of my former students um, and his name is Kalayaan Mendoza. And this is something because of what's happening in this moment, the international uh, and national protest for justice, he created these signs that's Filipinx for black lives. And so, so just maybe last month, a lot of the Filipino organizations um, started protesting and were in solidarity with the Black Lives Matter movement, um, specifically to the San Jose State uh, Club, the De Anza Club, Filipino Amer American National Historical Society, Anak Bayan, um, and there was other, other Filipino American organizations and Filipino organizations that joined to be in solidarity for that. Next slide. And so um, I want you to, uh, I want to close with this um, as I transition to Manang Robert, who I have, very, have high regard and respect for. Uh, and so this is a picture of, of the Pinoy Town tour. And so what we're trying to do is we are actually trying to um, bring these tours to the community, not only for the Filipino and Filipino American community, but for the community at large to learn about the, uh, the legacy of the Pinoy town in Japantown. Um, uh, and so this is a picture of one of the first Pinoy town tours and it's very intergenerational. You have uh, college students, you have uh, young, uh, young adults, professionals, and then you have, uh, of course you have the uh, elders. And so this was just one of the, one of the tours that we're gonna be doing. Uh, with Filipino American National Historical Society. And this is right here uh, down the street from Filipino Community Center. And uh, I'm on the right there with my partner, Hiroko. And then you can see Mano Robert in the middle. But um, this is very contemporary. This is probably right before COVID happened. Um, and we're going to be continuing these. I teach at De Anza College. And um, hopefully I'll be teaching the Philippinex uh, American History class. And I'll be doing this with the, the students to take them on these tours to learn about the rich history of the Pinoy town um, in, in back in the day. But with that, I just want to say thank you again. And um, I think this will be a great transition for Manang Robert. But yeah. thank you. Thank you so much, Tony, for your wonderful presentation. If you can unmute yourself for just one second. Sure. Um, I'd, I'd like to, just for the viewers out there who may not know, what does the term Philippine X mean? Yeah, so that's a very interesting uh, work, uh, interesting concept as well as identity. Um, so, so Philippine X, uh, there's a quick let, quick stories of, of people wanted to use uh, Filipino or Philippine A or, or Philippine X. Some people use the F uh, and some people use the P to spell it. Um, for those uh, that use the P like myself, uh, it is because in Tagalog there's no F. And also it's a political statement that was very, very much came about in the 1970s around the, around the, the civil rights era, right? Um, and so then it actually transitioned to uh, Pinoy, uh, P-I-N at symbol Y. That was like in the 90s and the 2000s. And that was to symbolize technology as well as gender um, uh, of men and women. And then also to talk about the sign of the times at that point. But then this generation actually uh, changed it. And so the X is more inclusive of all different uh, of genders. And so X could be gender non-binary or it can be gender fluid, uh, but it's not just the male or female. So it all, it, it's being more inclusive of the different varied um, identities that, that the Filipino um, and Philippine X um, uh, people uh, represent. So that's a short historical context, but very much it's just being more inclusive of the various gender identities in our communities. Okay, thank you so much, Tony. That was great. And um, uh, before we move on to our next uh, uh, presenter, 
Um, I'd like to encourage viewers, if you have any questions or comments, please put them in the Facebook chat because uh, that keeps us in touch with, with the people we're broadcasting to. Um, our next presenter is uh, Robert Ragsack, who's a retired aerospace engineer. He's an activist in the community and instrumental in collecting and preserving the history of the Filipinos in the Santa Clara Valley. He has given many lectures. You know, Robert is just an incredible scholar. Um, if, if you were lucky enough to get one of the big San Jose Japantown history books, there would be hardly anything about the Filipinos if it weren't for Robert Ragsack. He, he connected all the researchers with the Filipinos who grew up in San Jose, Japantown. And Robert himself is a direct link to the very first Filipinos who came to San Jose in the Santa Clara Valley. So the, uh, the people of that generation, and it's a great pleasure to have you here, Robert. <laughs> uh, thanks, Kurt. Okay, I'll turn this, uh, the presentation over to you. Okay, thank you. I'd like to... Uh give everybody a tour of uh, our, uh, actually a, sort of like a virtual tour of uh, Pinoy Town and how it emerged and its relationship to historic Hainanville Chinatown where three uh, cultures uh, intermingled. Uh, and my culture of course is Filipino. I am a second generation Filipino American. My father Sergio Ragsack is from Santa Catalina Ilocosor, so he's Ilocano. And my mom is from La Paz, Abra, and she's Ilocana. <laughs> and my dad um, signed up to be a Sakada, a contract worker for the Hawaii Sugar Planters Association. So he ended up in uh, Hawaii and actually in Kauai. He met my mother there in Kauai uh, in 1924. And in 1927, they migrated to uh, the mainland because my, my uncles, um, Leoncho and Burnaby were already here. So they uh, got together and they settled here in uh, what's uh, now called Chinatown. So I'll give you an orientation that shows in the next slide what uh, area we're talking about. That entire area outlined in magenta, uh, it was done by Roy Fukuda. And it shows the entire uh, core area of Japantown. And I've uh, isolated within it uh, the areas that I'm talking about. One in, in red is the Hainanville Chinatown and the Sixth Street Chinatown. And in blue is the historic Hainanville Chinatown area from those dates shown, 1891 through 1930s. And then within that, as the years went on, um, as uh, Highlandville declined, then six of the, uh, many of the Chinese residents and businesses migrated onto Sixth Street where there already was a, uh, a collection of uh, Japanese residents and uh, stores. And so it became an area where the, uh, the three cultures mixed. Now, there are areas outside of the uh, main area of Chinatown and I'll give you a reference there. Um, there's Japantown Timeline Bench, which you may be familiar with, and directly across the, the street. And if you go into Chinatown, you got to go to Roy Station. And then there's uh, down on Fifth Street, which is labeled Main Street here, is the Buddhist Church. And you'll notice that there is colors there that I use to identify the three groups. The Chinese is in blue, and the Japanese is in magenta. It looks like it comes out pink and the Filipinos are in brown. <clears throat> There's uh, outside of the main Sixth Street area, there were several areas, uh, locations that were important. On the right side, you'll see that there's Northside Community Center, which uh, um, Tony talked about. And then at the bottom is the Arevalo House, where uh, uh, Steve, uh, where uh, Tony said his mentor, Steve, his father was Isadora Arevalo. And, uh, and I, I worked with Steve in uh, several areas and we talked and we were trying to get information on the Grand Oriente. And that's what the show there at the corner of 
uh, Fort Ann Jackson is the Grand Oriente Filipino Masonic Lodge. And then uh, on the uh, far side of the uh, Main Street or Sick uh, Fifth Street on Taylor is the Filipino Presbyterian Church with uh, Reverend Callao and his wife, Mercedes. And uh, when uh, my mom and dad migrated here, they located in the, um, by happenstance, in what is now the Japantown area. And those little house icons are where we lived throughout the years. I was particularly uh, interested uh, in 4th Street because I was born on 648 North 4th Street. My mother couldn't make it to the county hospital. And uh, she was helped to, to bring me into the world by Uo Kawamura, Dr. Kawamura's wife. So I'm going to get into more details. Uh, let's see, I think I covered everything there. Um, you'll notice that the, uh, the Highlandville area there in blue had a street called Cleveland Avenue, and it was bisected by, uh, by uh, DuPont, Kearney, and Clay. Um, I'll mention some of those streets later on. So we'll get a little more detail in the next slide. Here we can see the entire area that was uh, outlined in red previously. That's the uh, historic uh, uh, Heinenville Chinatown and then the Sixth Street Chinatown and the Pitou what was emerging to be the Pinoy Town area. The, uh, just to give you a little reference, there are three or four uh, buildings that still exist there. Um, the uh, Nishoka Brothers uh, Fish Market, which has actually uh, started out as Surakawa's ideal laundry company. And then as uh, Tony mentioned, the Filipino Community Hall, at that time it was identified as Filipino Community Hall. And the renovated building was called Filipino Community of Santa Clara County. That's at 635. And one of the mainstays and icons of Sixth Street Chinatown is Kenyan Low Restaurant at uh, 625 North 6. And then on the far right is the uh, a brick building that still exists, which is now a Kogura store. Now, when I talk about the Sixth Street, there's the three cultures and identify the Chinese as the Sixth Street of Chinatown. I also call the Japanese owned stores and residences Nihonmachi, that for purposes of identifying those people and their businesses, uh, I use the term Nihonmachi because the term Japantown did not exist at that time. And then uh, Pinoy Town is also a, a term I use later as I did some research uh, that, uh, that most of which is reported in uh, Kurt uh, Fukuda's and Ralph Pearson's uh, Pantom book. So this, this is a, actually a way of trying to identify the three major cultures and uh, actually the immigrants of the three different races that merged into uh, Chinatown. All right, imagine that you're a photographer standing upon on the roof of the Kagura store on the right side of there on the brick building. And uh, you took a picture and you'll see that what came out in the next slide. Here you have a picture of three Filipino owned stores and one Japanese uh, store as the Tutu's uh, neighborhood grocery store on 615, Yamato Bathhouse, Canuto's Barbershop at 610, uh, Canuto Magdasilla, and Diet's uh, uh, grocery store. Uh, and in the background, uh, it's maybe hard to see, but there are still remnants of the old Highland, Highlandville Chinatown. And in the, uh, on the far back, uh, you will see some brick buildings. Those were a lot of the, what we call the food processing areas. That's where most of the canneries. So the view you're seeing is North 6th Street in the foreground. And on the right side, going towards the railroad crossing on the far right is uh, Jackson. Now again, suppose you're a photographer standing right in the middle of 6th Street, just in front of Diets, and you snap the following picture. Next slide. There's Canuto's Barbershop on the right. Now we're looking north, and that's Taylor Street on the far right. Now I know there's a Yamato bathhouse you can see in magenta color. And then next to it, as I mentioned before, Tutut's Philippines Neighborhood Grocery Store. 
And just beyond that are two Filipino-owned stores, uh, businesses, Bacosa's Universal Cafe and Subnet's Variety Store, the, his Five and Time store. On the left, you'll see the iconic Kenyango restaurant. And in the far distance, as I mentioned, the Surakawa Ideal Laundry. Now for a future reference, uh, keep in mind, I marked the tree landmark for uh, a few sides uh, later on. Notice that the parking is diagonal on both sides of the street on that, uh, in that area. Now, just to make sure you understand that we are looking at the east side of 6th Street. So, and uh, we'll get uh, the next slide to show a little bit more about the uh, Filipino neighborhood grocery store. In those days, as teenagers, I had to go hang out at all of the stores, Japanese and Chinese included, because it was just a great place to be. Well, when you're a teen, you like to be where all the excitement is. And this, is the, this was in the 19, late 30s and then the 1940s. And there's my friends, uh, Mary Balmoha, Jewel Miguel, and Tanya Moto. And uh, you'll notice that the Coca-Cola signs have not changed very much in those days, except for the picture of the woman there. Now, the three of uh, 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 my friends there are standing in front of a door. It was classic at that time for an alleyway between the buildings. So if you did move through that building, uh, move through that door, you would end up in the old Highland Mill uh, wooden structures. And they gave you access to the second floor of these uh, buildings on 6th Street. Because most of the buildings were two-story at that time. So just beyond, um, as we go down the street here, just beyond uh, Tud Tuds is uh, on the next slide was the Bacosa's Universal Cafe that was located at 620. Um, this is not a very good picture, but I didn't have <laughs> a good capability and I couldn't afford Photoshop. But anyway, you can see Bacosa's Universal Cafe on the right, great place to hang out, Filipino food, and World War II surface flag on the window. And you'll notice too, there's a, uh, the window on Subnets. I was able to make out that it really did spell out Subnets five cent, 10 cent store as exactly as I remember it. So after the variety store, as we keep moving down on the next slide, you'll see the full gospel, Filipino full gospel mission is one of the, but as known, three known churches at the time. As I mentioned before, there was Reverend Callao's Presbyterian Church, and this is the full gospel mission. And um, I was able to get a picture, we don't have a picture of the actual building itself because uh, as pictures most likely tend to turn out, there's a great view of the, of the people, but as a historian, I sure would like to see what the buildings look like. And here in this picture, it's um, uh, identified as a uh, to daddy, which is Emil Ventar from the gang. And then you see the names there. Uh, okay, further on, and then next slide. As there's our tree reference on the left. So now we are on the far end near Taylor Street, looking towards Jackson. And using the property directory uh, identifiers at, uh, at that, this time, which I assume the picture was about mid 40s. So I used the 1947 occupants and addresses and I identified uh, those that you see again in color. Uh, the uh, Filipino Community Center that would uh, soon emerge is at 635, you can see that. And uh, now we see the Marver Lodge, which is the uh, uh, lodge number seven of the Caballeros de Dumasalan. And just beyond that is again, the iconic Kenyan Lo restaurant. And on the left side, just before, just behind the tree, again, is the full gospel mission. This picture actually has part of a Highland built brick building on the left. And if that's so, this Clay Street, I estimate. And Clay Street among, as well as Kearney Street, was uh, well known to the Filipinos at the time because they had a whole lot of gambling going on there. 
All right, I'll say that. Well, continue on. Now, as I said, there's the Sirikawa's uh, ID Laundry. Um, this, he had this building built in uh, about 1929, but the style of uh, art, architecture and art deco then of the 1920s. This building over the years was used as a Chinese courthouse. Max Peralta had a restaurant there, and it was used over the years by Japanese, Chinese, and Philippine immigrants, both as a residence and business. Now you could take a close look, you can still see the uh, just by the stamina up sign, the EA, and then on the right side, a little bit of the Y and CO, which spells out ideal laundry. Well, one of the workers at the ideal laundry was my Uncle Ben, who's shown in the next slide. This is Ulate Ben Rabi Ragset, Uncle Ben Rabi Ragset. He worked for Surakawa in the early 1930s. This picture is what we estimated from his kid, his children, to be about 1930. If so, he's about 25 years old. Uh, because of the, now 1929, most of you may not remember, but 1929 was a fantastic uh, depression occurred. And uh, the effects of that depression still went on in the 30s. So it was really tough for Surakawa san and he offered the business to my Uncle Ben. And he eventually bought the business and relocated it at 611 further down uh, 6th Street towards Jackson. Well, you can see that Surakawa uh, had still a close connection to his homeland. You can see the, the Japanese dolls and the clay pot in the window. Well, my Uncle Ben, when uh, the decline of the 19, in about 1950s of Chinatown, uh, he uh, moved the business to Watsonville. So I'd like to say that for Ichimatsu Surakawa, your, your ideal laundry concept lived for over 60 years. So we'll move down further on six feet on the uh, west side and we'll see in the next slide, the Filipino Community Center. This was what it looked like at the time. Now, this is about 1950s, I believe. Yeah. A group of Filipinos had the foresight to tool their funds to buy the land and put up a building at 635 North 6th Street in 1956. So uh, this building replaced the wooden building that was there at the time. Um, it was remodeled and modernized in 1961, and that's the community center picture that uh, that Tony showed you uh, earlier. We were able to find out who were the original known community center founders. Now, at the time that um, the timeline bench on Fifth and Jackson was was uh, being planned, I was asked to try to, to to get a date for the Filipino community when it was established. Well, I went to the uh, to the center and talked to the Filipinos there at that time. And they had no recollection of any of the names. That just shows you how disassociated the current Filipinos are to the original immigrants who paved their way. Well, through a series of talks with my contemporaries and as well as some, a couple of the living uh, first wave Filipinos, we were able to identify the founders so there's Max, Jean, and Tony Peralta, the brothers, and the brothers Esteban and Mariano Catolico. Severino Rusty of the Grand Oriente Filipino, the uh, Masonic Lodge. Val Ardonez is the barber. Frank Bravo is the barber also. And Leo Escalante, who owned the pool hall. And I'll show you a picture of him later. And Alex Fabros uh, Sr., who is a photographer. Over the years, the building was used as a meeting place for card games and also provided rooms and a kitchen in the, kitchen in the back for the older Filipinos, which uh, we now call them the Manong generation. Uh, Larry Montero and Frank Bravo had the barbershop up front in the front of the building. And as uh, the building was actually on the property that was owned by Tony Bertudis, 
who at one time operated a restaurant there in that same building. Now, this building is uh, followed the original one, which was in 1930s and 1940s with a wooden structure. In the 1940s, um, I remember when uh, just a little kid going into the community center, it was dark and dingy with about three, four, five card tables. And then in the back, you could see the, some parts of the rooms and the kitchen. And it was smoky. In those days, everybody smoked. But it was a great place for them to, uh, for all the first wave Filipinos to interact, to, to meet and talk story. Well, just next to the Philippine Community Center, as we walk down, as we continue on the next slide, you'll see what was located as the Caballeros de Dumasalan, uh, Marvel Lodge Number 7. Now, the, the Caballeros de Dumasalan is translated as the Knights of Dimasalang. Now the name Dimasalang came about as the lodge was founded in honor of Dr. Jose Rizal, who's known the plume for his authorships, his, his uh, books was called, uh, he called it Dimasalang. Well, the original term is Hindi, in Tagalog was Hindi Dimasalang, which means do not touch. Well, one of the books that uh, Dr. Jose Rizal wrote was Noli Me Tangare, which I think believes Latin for uh, do not touch. In the equivalent in Tagalog is Hindi Dimasalang. Well, the term was condensed. Instead of Hindi Masalang, it became Dimasalang. And all of this is in honor of uh, the, uh, the large uh, was a honor for Dr. Jose Rizal, who was a real great activist, fought, uh, he wrote against the Spanish rule and his reward for doing that was being executed by the Spanish in the Philippines. Well, the um, next to the Damasalang building, deals, well, I'm sorry, uh, here's a good picture of how serious the members of the Marvel Lives number seven took. I couldn't find anybody, any one of these Pinoys smiling in this picture. Maybe there's Max Peralta holding back a smile. Max Peralta on the left, lower left, is the Filipino community leader. And he's also a grandmaster of the Caballeros de Masalan. Just in the middle of the picture, right above the emblem, is uh, Bender B. Reichsack. That's my Olete my uncle and uh, Larry Mortera there right is on the far left is the barber. Uh, another person of interest is uh, at the top is Mariano Catolico who is uh, one of the founders of the community center and right next to him is Dalmacio Danny Kabibi is my stepfather. Now each of these you know is have an interesting story. As I mentioned, that my uncle who owned the laundry, Max Peralta, who is, is a big story behind him. And also an interesting one for Mar Mariano Catolico. Well, it, I have a lot of stories for each of these, but I'll do a real brief one for Mariano. He was a tremendously interested in history. Now this was in the era where most of the Filipino immigrants had maybe a fifth, sixth, grade elementary school type education. My dad says his ended at the fifth grade. Well, Mariano was very interested in history, so he got himself prepared to, and ultimately was accepted at the University of California. He earned a bachelor's degree in 1933 in history and a master's degree in 1934, also in history. And his dream was to become a teacher. Well, this is the 1930s who, what college or what school would hire a Filipino teacher? So he became a contractor and, I mean, a, a labor contractor and a farm laborer himself. Another brief interesting story too is this Antonio Abasolo on the right side. His wife was named Lena. Lena is a Native American Indian from the Pomo tribe of Northern California. And there are a bunch of other stories. Maybe that would be part two for a presentation.
All right, from the uh, the uh, Dimaslang building, right next to it was Ken Ying Lo, the iconic Ken Ying Lo. Uh, it was one of our favorite restaurants. The other was Wings at 131 East Jackson. And us teenagers used to uh, frequent the, the buildings, the restaurants, and uh, all we could afford was one large bowl of soup and uh, requested four spoons. The owner of Jimmy was, uh, of Ken Ying Lo was Jimmy Ning. Uh, he was considered the unofficial mayor of Chinatown, uh, but others say it was actually Charlie Moore. Now, Jimmy's son, Larry Ning, was a very close friend of ours. So close that all of our pictures of us Filipino tween, uh, teens, there's Larry in there. Well, now Larry lived right in the midst of Chinatown, where the Filipinos and Japanese were. And Larry got exposed to that kind of a culture. In fact, so exposed that when he would talk to us kids sometimes, he would start imitating the Ilocanos accent when they're trying to speak English. He was so good, it was better than we could imitate the Ilocanos speaking English. Now he is what I would call example number two of mixing the cultures. Example number one is Oleteg Ben Nurbi Ragsak, who worked for a Japanese um, immigrant. immigrant. Well, it's not unusual because a lot of the laborers, uh, Filipino laborers and field workers, uh, worked for Japanese uh, farmers. In fact, my dad worked uh, for Kawahara on a ranch. So that's uh, what I call two examples of what, we, what I consider to be this merging and this uh, diversification of, uh, in that area where they, all of the races, the three races, uh, got along so well. Well, continuing on, there was much more than just chopped soy at, at, at Kenyon Lo. Here we can see the Philippine Food Mart and Curious Shop. This was actually was used throughout the years as a storage card room. And, uh, and I would assume, but I can't know proof, that there was gambling going on there. And so there's a, uh, this is one of the cases where, uh, in fact, there was a restaurant uh, at the uh, first floor. And so here is the unusual arrangement. Upstairs on the second floor was Ken Ying Lo Chinese restaurant. And on the first floor was a Filipino restaurant. So that shows you how well these uh, two, two groups got, got along. So we continue down on further to uh, the end of the, um, the tour. There's the uh, um, Escalante's pool hall as I remember it. Now the original one was at uh, uh, the corner of Fourth and Jackson up to 1934. And then this corner at Sixth and Jackson was a pool hall through about the 1950s. But the last known one that for the, that showed in this picture is Leo Escalante in 1930. He ran from 1938 to 1941. Even my uncle uh, Urbano, Urbano Ragsack, who was a cousin of the Ragsack brothers, my dad and and his brothers, Leoncio and Ben Yeah, uh, Uncle Urbano owned it from 19, uh, in 1935 to just uh, uh, a few years. Now you can see in the picture um, that we distinctly remember, I checked with my sisters, uh, Helen and Elaine, and they said, it's exactly as they remember it. There's a snack bar on the counter on the right side, the ping pong tables on the back, there was even a um, uh, pinball machine on the side next near the uh, ping pong tables. I don't know if you could see that. What's missing in this picture on the left at the very corner of Sixth and Jackson is an alcove where all the gambling took place. So you could hear the uh, click of the tiles or the cards and the, and the smoke coming out of that room as I remember it. Unfortunately, the only person that we can re recall here was Escalante, Leo Escalante Sr. And that's probably only because his son identified him here. But the other Filipinos, we, some we recognize, but actually uh, we don't know their names. That's a result of us kids, us 
Philam teens or kids as we grew up, you never addressed an older one by his name. No, we never addressed them by their first or full name. Unless, and the only way, no way we knew their names was when we heard either of my parents or someone else address them in their names. But we, when we called, uh, when we met them, any of these older Filipinos, we would say it's Manong or Manong or, or auntie or uncle. But uh, so because of that, when we see these old pictures, we recognize the face, but cannot remember who their names were. So I think uh, that sort of ends this verbal and visual tour. So let's recap what's happened here. So here's a picture of the uh, area of uh, Sixth Street with uh, the uh, residents and uh, businesses are identified. Now you'll see that uh, it's probably difficult to see the names, but that's not important right now. What's important is the color. So I call, because of the colors I use, I call this the rainbow neighborhood. Well, it was more than just a color, it was the three races. So what, what you can see here is that what happened was as, as Chinatown, as Hymanville declined, the, uh, many of the residences and businesses migrated to, into uh, Sixth Street, along with the Japanese uh, from about 1915 on to 1942. And so as with the Japanese and, as, and uh, Filipino, uh, bef as well as the Japanese before them, the Japanese immigrants, a lot of the Filipinos would come to Sixth Street for shopping, entertainment, and talk to their uh, town mates and, uh, and gamble. Uh, speaking of gambling, there's a great quote in Connie Young News book on Hannonville, Chinatown, San Jose, uh, that there were three businesses in Hannonville. There was the laundry business, the restaurant business, and the gambling business. And guess which one was most dominant? In fact, when I checked out with uh, Connie's book, there was a gambling establishments just on 6th Street at where Kearney Street and Clay Street intersect. Well, for, as, uh, as you can see, that's quite a bit of magenta, quite a bit of blue, and, and I think four or so, five uh, brown. So there was a mix uh, in these cultures. Well, this is 1941. So what happened in December? The attack on Pearl Harbor by the Japanese Imperial Navy. So. We did not have any directory information for 1942, I, I presume, because of the war. But we did have one for 1943, it's in the next slide, which shows you that executive, the results of Executive Order 9066, which was the, uh, the order for all Japanese immigrants and, uh, and their children, the Issei and Issei, to be uh, interned and relocation camps. So when you look at this, all of the magenta is gone. And in fact, uh, one of the uh, results of that was that many of the abandoned buildings were taken over or rented by Filipinos. And so you'll see a predominance of brown and some of the leftover uh, blue. Just about this time, I, I should say that I've talked about Chinese, Japanese, and Filipinos, but there was in this year that um, a Reverend Milton Mathis rented this building at 651 uh, for his Black Church of Christ of God in Christ. So there was a Black Church there. Well, not only were there a Black Church, but there was also at least three Black cult, uh, Black uh, families, or maybe I should say couples, because I did not see any of the kids. Uh, they resided at, uh, at, at some of the boarding rooms. And that meant that uh, there was more than just the Chinese, Japanese, and Filipinos there. There were the black church and these uh, three couples. Now, the reason I know that there were at least the three couples is that in that year, in those years, I was a paper boy delivering the San Jose Mercury Herald. My route was called 312, and it covered Chinatown. In those days, the delivery boys had to collect for the subscription fees. 
So I went down to Chinatown and went upstairs and collected from two black couples. There was a third, uh, I think he was just a man that I remember seeing in one of the buildings. So the upshot is that there indeed was a, a true mix of uh, cultures here, especially when you had the Sunday services or Saturday services at the uh, Black Church of God in Christ. Well, let's sum this all up in the next slide. And uh, you can see that in the 1920s, as I mentioned, many of the Filipino and Filipina immigrants patronized Heinemann <clears throat> In fact, I remember when I was a little boy, taking my mother took me to Heinemann and she wanted to go shopping there. And the only place that I can recall that was big enough at the time was Cleveland Avenue. And I saw all of these uh, Chinese men wearing black with their long pigtails. I guess they were uh, standard uh, uh, at that time. Also, I remember the Ning Chinggong Temple on the, at the corner of Six and, and, and Taylor. So many of the Filipinos did uh, patronize all of those stores. As the decline occurred, then of course, many of the residents and businesses located to Sixth Street. Well, I mean, in the period 1931 to 41, there was uh, this large influx of Filipinos and Filipinas. That created what I call a tricultural location, where you have a social, cultural, and socioeconomic intermingling among the three major minority groups. And before diversity became a popular name, these groups of people lived it. And they achieved, whether they intended or not, what I could conceive to be a racial harmony. For I don't remember of any conflicts among the three uh, races. Uh, there were some conflicts within the Filipinos, uh, but uh, amongst the three in general, there was not any. So what this all led to was an area or collective that we call Pinoy Town. Well, Pinoy Town didn't last very long as the next slide shows. It lasted almost uh, not quite 30 years. Uh, the interactions, as I say, amongst the, the three uh, uh, races uh, was not a melting pot as say, uh, as uh, per se, as uh, many would suspect. As far as I know, there were no interracial marriages or social family mixtures or anything like that, or combined uh, celebrations. I only know of two known well, Pinoy Nisei marriages of that, uh, of that time. Well, as the years go on, all of the uh, population in the uh, Chinatown, Pinoy Town, Nihonachi area uh, aged. Well, Nihonachi, of course, disappeared because of Executive Order 9966. But as the population heard, uh, age and as the, uh, and the children, my generation, grew older, got married, went off to school, entered service or found jobs in other areas. So Chinatown as, and the Pinoy Town, as I knew it and as I always kids knew it, disappeared and went into history. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Robert, for uh, your presentation. And uh, just for the audience out there, you used the term Pinoy a couple of times. Can you please tell uh, the, the viewers what Pinoy means? Okay, uh, Pinoy uh, was a term that uh, I grew up with, but I didn't know its origin, but I heard or I read or I was told that the term Pinoy first was used in a 1920s college book by, I believe, it was a Filipino group, but I don't know the school or the college. It's, I believe, and I also think it was in uh, Don Mabalon's book. Um, I think it was Little Manila is in the heart. But as, it, as the term was used, and as I, uh, as I matured also, uh, it, it appears that the term Pinoy or Pinay was used to distinguish the Filipinos 
immigrants who are living here in the United States from the Filipinos who are living in the Philippines. Uh, I don't know if Tony has anything to add to that, but uh, this was uh, in the day. Uh, of course, as uh, Tony mentioned, the X is now used uh, as to cover all the, the, uh, the possibilities. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. Thank you, both you and Tony, for your presentation today. And um, before uh, we get on, I turn it back to uh, Chris. Uh, I, I noticed there was a, on your map, uh, on Robert's map, Chris, I noticed the Hioki at 655 uh, North 6th Street. It said a cleaners. Is that one of your ancestors? <laughs> Uh, <laughs> yeah, so my family used to have the uh, um, a laundry out on uh, that location. So it was, uh, if you notice the um, on the map, it's under uh, S. Hioki, which was my uncle Shig. So it was under um, uh, Shig's name because at that time, my uh, grandfather, Tokoro, uh, could not own the property. So... Um, Oh yeah, yeah. So we did have uh, uh, the, the laundry over there a little bit before my time, but um, <laughs> I did help out some. But uh, yeah, it, it was a family laundry. Uh, you'll probably be very interested to know if, if for those of you who go back to episode two, six fifty five North Sixth Street was the location that Connie Young Hughes' uh, grandfather and father moved to after Highlandville was taken over by the city. So they were in 655, just before it was, uh, before the Hiokis moved in. <laughs> so a bit of trivia. Anyway, I turn the program back to you, Chris. Yeah, yeah so um, it's time for our uh, Q&A. And, um, you know, we're hoping everybody can ask, uh, you know, type in their questions. So uh, while you're typing in your questions, there are a couple of people that I'd like to thank. Uh, one is the, um, the Hidden History of San Jose, uh, Japantown, the team. And uh, for this uh, presentation, i uh, really like to thank Tom, Izu, Susan Hayase, Corinne Takata Okada, and uh, Sui Wen. So uh, you guys were just, were, were huge helps. Um, on the jam side, um, uh, Kent Carson and Emma Toe really helped out with the, the slides, creating the slides. Um, Emmy Yoshikawa and Stacy Fuji uh, helped with the Facebook and the social media side. Uh, Suze, uh, Sydney Casson is um, she, uh, behind the scenes. So she's, uh, been helping out quite a few, quite a bit with our programs, um, as well as you know, creating flyers and doing you know so much for jams. Uh, Gail Nakahira for helping out with the uh, the presentation and for the, this particular program and, and just a whole bunch more. So Gail has really been been a, a huge help um, for our live stream product or project. Uh, Michael Sarah uh, for doing the producing for this event. And, um, and my personal thanks to the uh, Public Programs Committee for, for helping and putting on these particular these projects. So um, yeah, let's get over to our uh, Q&A here. Um, I did see a, a question uh, from uh, Ted Ramos and he was asking, um, is the Ng family still around? Um, let's see, no. I as far as I know, I, I do know that Larry Ning had passed away, and so did his uh, parents, but I believe he has a sister, um, and she is still alive. And, uh, and, but however, that information is about five years old. So I'm not quite sure. Okay, okay thank you for the question, Ted. Uh, Susan Hayase asked, um, I heard the city wants to name the new park in the former Highlandville Chinatown to Sakura Park. And just wonder if anybody had any feelings on that. Uh, well, let's see, I guess maybe I should mention that uh, from my personal point of view, I, this naming of this park is, uh, is a 
sort of like the a, a series of trends. And I can say the trends. Uh, first was the destruction of the Mingxin Gong uh, Chinese temple, the, the Josh House on 6th and Taylor. Uh, it was declared that after Hanlin building was declined, that, that building was left by itself. It was, it was deemed a hazard by the city of San Jose. And in 1949, they destroyed it. I, it should, the term is actually demolished, but I use the word destroyed because it seemed to have, to me, an intent. And then anyway, they put up a, a fire station there. And then the city of San Jose took over the corporate, it took over the property itself and emerged and, and enlarged it to become the corporation yard. And on top of that, because of a full-size corporation yard, they destroyed the brick buildings and all of the buildings on the west side of 6th Street. So there's no, vision, no visible reminder of what occurred on the west side of 6th Street. And then on top of that, the, that entire area vanished. So they're going to name a park, Sakura, which to me has no actual meaning at all. And whether, if you do name that part Sakura, that in effect continues, completes the trend of what happened. So what, what you see now is that the term Sakura has no emotional connection to me, to the past. But if you named it John Heinlein for crying out loud, he's the guy that started the whole thing. Where would Japantown be today if Heinlein did not offer that property? And that's my personal take. This is actually is an elimination of the three immigrant races, the Chinese, Japanese, and Filipinos, who found a way, regardless of their diversity, to achieve racial harmony. Now, is that achievement? 1930s, 1940s, and what are you gonna do? You're gonna name it Sakura? What, what does that mean to anybody other than whoever it was that proposed it? And uh, I better stop there before I get to, to it. <laughs> I can see Tony it's nodding over there <laughs> and Kurt. That's my take. Okay, thank you, Robert. Uh, just to let you know is uh, Sydney has typed into the uh, Facebook chat uh, the URLs for uh, Hidden Histories, um, the YouTube channel, uh, the Filipino American National Historical Society, uh, Northside Community Center, their Facebook page, uh, the Kukyu uh, Clothing Store, and the Arsenal. So if you check your uh, Facebook chat, you'll have the... Um, uh, the links to those particular organizations. And uh, thank you so much for doing that, Sydney. Uh, Will Kaku had a uh, question here and he asked, um, may have said that there wasn't any tension between the uh, Filipinx and Japanese communities after the war. Um, that's uh, very interesting uh, to Will. Um, why do you think this was the case? Well, um uh, let me see. The I suspect um, we'll, we'll have to think of the environment at the time, 1930s, 1940s, anti-Asian environment. You know, Chinese Exclusion Act. But then from from the federal government on the way down to the local city governments, right, to the city councils, all the anti-Asian, anti-Chinese, anti-Japanese, anti-Turkey, and so because of that. What do you do when you say, I, I have to go somewhere, I want to go where I don't have that. I don't have that anti-Asian feeling, anti -Asian. Well, Highlandville was one of them, and ultimately Chinatown. And so, in, even if there may have been some tension between them, what was their proper benefit was a place to be without being rioted against or screamed at. And also, you've got uh, what I call one of the major social imperatives, and that's gambling, as well as shopping. So there's social or economic. And, uh, and maybe to some extent, there was social or cultural. Maybe they were interested in each other. So uh, they somehow made it work. Uh, I'm not a cultural anthropologist, but that was my experience. 
Uh, Tony, can you do you have anything to add to that? I mean, no, I, I think you know you 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 lived that history, so I think you'd have a better cultural context than I. So that's why I'm not saying anything. <laughs> <laughs> but but I believe it could be something of a model. Don't you believe mm-hmm. that? Mm-hmm. That uh, or at least a very example of uh, what is possible. Mm-hmm. Uh, thanks for the question. That's uh, that's really good. Susan Edwards uh, Driscoll and um, Susan asks, uh, "Do you remember the casino and pool hall at Taylor Street and Thirteenth Street in the fifties and beyond?" Uh, no, no, I don't. I, uh, it was it Taylor and? Yeah, 13th. I know where that is, but I don't remember. All I remember at, well, let's see, that was in the 50s then. No, I, I don't recall that. Uh, you'll have to remember that in, in that era, my era, uh, at 13th Street and beyond was cherry orchards. In fact, there were all orchards and farms beyond that at that time. Uh, so I, I'm sorry, I don't have any information on that. Uh, let's see. And actually, this is another uh, one. This is from uh, Ted uh, Ramos. Uh, do, you re- do you remember the card rooms that, that you had mentioned? Um, 616 Club on North 6th Street and the Far East Social Club on uh, at 640 North 6th Street? Uh, th- See, I have those labeled uh, in uh, one of my more detailed uh, uh, charts, but I did not know anything, anything about that. I have only the, the, the identifiers, which is the club names. Uh, the only one that I know of was next to the uh, Surakawa building. Um, it was called the Dragon Club. Uh, and, and it was um, Beer Garden, I believe, as well as the card room. But that's the only one I know personally. The others are just uh, labels that I I took off the uh, Polk uh, uh, property directory. But but there were card games. Uh, I should say that there were card games going on in a lot of the buildings that were not formal businesses, like the community center. There are tremendous card games going on in the back room. I guess next uh, question is for uh, Tony. And uh, Tony, w- what's your favorite uh, Japantown moment or memory? Wow. Uh, yeah, I have many. I have lots. Um, well, well, currently, one of my favorite memories is being on the Hidden Histories community panel uh, advisory, honestly, because uh, I get to um, work with intergenerational folks that really love J- Japantown. And so I just love it to see community members come together and, and really want to preserve history and culture. So that's one of my current ones. But when I was younger um, at Filipino Community Center, when I was in high school, I actually performed at a Filipino party, um, dancing with my dance group. Uh, my, it wasn't like a traditional traditional group, but it was a, more of a street, street dance type. So that's one of my favorite memories of big going to Philcom. We called it Philcom for short. Uh, so that was one of my favorite memories, but memories are always popping up for me, uh, cause there's always something amazing happening, uh, in J town. So I'm glad, uh, that I was, um, that I'm able to be a part of it. So. Oh, perfect. Uh, let's see. This question is from uh, Alec and, uh, he asks, uh, could you talk more about the cannery historic building that is by the railroad tracks? Uh, Alec lives in the Espelante I was curious what it used to be like over the years. Okay, that was the Continental Can Company. That's uh, the building right by the railroad tracks on Taylor, uh, correct? If that's what the question is. And uh, that was uh, used for um, canning the uh, fruits from the Valley of Hearts Delight, uh, tomatoes, uh, uh, other fruits, uh, cherries, peaches, apricots. Um, the railroad track it, uh, itself, the railroad there was used to bring empty cans to the uh, can, to the Continental Can Company. And uh, at night, 
uh, you could hear the chain, uh, uh, train cars moving into uh, to the building, and then you could hear the rolling of the empty cans. That was one of my jobs: was to unload the can, the empty cans, with this multiple pronged fork uh, device, and you grab the empty cans by the open area, uh, open side, and then roll, put it on a roller, and it would roll down into the cannery itself. Uh, and it was noisy. And by the way, I know you probably, if you live at the Esplanade, that uh, you probably hear the trains going on uh, every once in a while. In the 1930s, 1940s, we could hear the steam whistles and they would go all night, mm -hmm. especially during the canning season. It was busy all the time. So if you get busy, <laughs> if you are bothered by an occasion, <laughs> uh, diesel locomotive going by, <laughs> Be thankful it wasn't like cannery the cannery years. Okay, thanks, Robert. Uh, here's a question from Susan: um, Was the Dragon Club a Chinese club or a Japanese or Filipino? Um, I have no information on that. Uh, I only saw the sign, and uh, I asked uh, Pinky. And he wasn't sure. All he knew, a Pinky Rentar is one uh, Filipino American who lived uh, during those years in Chinatown. In fact, at, at the Masalan uh, boarding house. Uh, but I have no idea whether it was Chinese or Japanese or Filipino. Um, my my guess would be that it was Filipino, because uh, the also was in combination. Uh, either with contemporary with, um, I believe, uh, Larry Mortero's Barbershop. Uh, but then that's a guess. Okay. okay. Um, let's see. We'll go ahead and we'll wind out with this uh, question. And, and Robert, can you uh, tell us what your favorite Japantown moment or memory is? Oh, well, that's a tough one. Well, okay. Let me give you a... It's, at least it's sort of like an anecdote. All right, this is Roy Station. Okay, uh, 19, uh, let's see, 1940s. So Roy Station was a real gas station, right? Okay, where by the equipment bay, uh, there's always kinds of a lot of activity going on there. So all the Filipino kids, and I guess some of the Japanese kids too, we used to hang around there and watch the mechanics at work or, or the... Uh, the cars come in, get filled up with gas. At one time, a police car backed into uh, close to the bay, and uh, and I believe it was uh, some of the mechanics was, was talking to the officers. Meanwhile, one of the mechanics from the from the maintenance bay rolled out a jack. He pulled up the uh, put the jack under the police car and slowly raised it. And as they were talking, then finally the police car, uh, the officers had to go to respond to a call. So they put it in gear and revved up and could not move because the rear wheels were up in the air. That one stuck in my mind as if it had occurred yesterday. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, well, thank you. Yeah, maybe I ought to update it. Stay. Thanks to Hidden Histories, I've given this opportunity to, to expose a lot of people to the hidden histories of Japan, of Pinot Town. Thanks to all of you in, in, in the Japanese American Museum. This is a fantastic opportunity for me, and I really thank you very much. Okay. Okay, well, um, yeah, we've been at this for a little while, so we'll go ahead and we'll, we'll move on here. And uh, thank you, everyone, for all your, your questions, and I uh, really appreciate it. Uh, so for our uh, next steps, um, yeah, if you could, one slide, please, our next. Um, so I think you were all on Facebook, so everybody's probably aware of Facebook, but if you could uh, like us uh, on Facebook, uh, really appreciate it. And uh, next, um, you can follow us, uh, follow the, the museum on uh, Twitter and Instagram. Next. And um, also, you've probably been there, but if you can visit uh, our website, that's jamsj.org, and I'd like to give a uh, shout out 
to um, Momo Cha, Ben uh, Karoma for their just their hard work on, on our website. They do a terrific job. Um, if you uh, are at the website and in the upper right is the uh, there's a support button. And if you click on that support button, um, you can become a member by clicking on member. You can uh, donate, and during these COVID times, it's uh, especially tough for all organizations and suffering that also right now. But uh, if you could, please, um, you know, click and, and donate to the museum. Um, also, I don't know if you've heard any uh, about Amazon Smile, but um, if you go to the Amazon Smile site, it, which you could find at the uh, the web the Jam's website. Um, 0.05% of all eligible pur purchases go to a, a charitable site. And uh, JAMS is one of those. So if you could click on that, um, and that would really help us out. And then next. And we can also go ahead, um, we can volunteer. So uh, we appreciate all of the, the JAMS volunteers. We're always looking for, for new volunteers. And uh, when I went ahead and thanked everybody uh, earlier, uh, they were all volunteers. And to each and every one of you, we're just so grateful. Without you, we wouldn't. Our museum uh, wouldn't be the, where it is right now. Probably we wouldn't even exist. So uh, thank you very much, Jam's volunteers. So um, yeah, thank you to everyone for uh, joining this Facebook Live presentation. Uh, you know, for participating. I know that, uh, you know, our, our times are really valuable. And so uh, we appreciate everyone coming aboard. Uh, I'd like to thank Kurt, Robert, Tony for your uh, presentations. Uh, you know, thank you to everybody for, uh, for joining into the, uh, the program. Be safe and uh, really hope to see you sometime soon. Okay. All right. Thanks so much. All right. Bye-bye.